Well, hello everyone. Welcome to the uh, Farms.com Precision Ag Conference. I'm Brandon Yacht and I'm here to present the 1145 breakout session entitled How Terracite and Site-Specific Soil Sampling Can Help You Better Understand How Complex Nutrient Interactions Impact Yield and Quality. I've been with a &L for a little over a year as their Business Development Manager in Precision Ag Technologies. Prior to this, I was working with the Agrimark Group for about 12 years. Uh, helping them lead their precision ag strategy. I had a procurement role, some training and marketing and product development. And then prior to that, I was at Syngenta for a little over six years in their R&D team. So I've been in the ag space about 20 years and precision ag has been near and dear to my heart. And I've been focusing on that for uh, the last six to eight years. So a little bit about a &L for those of you that don't know. a &L is an analytics lab here in London, Ontario that's been in operation since 1985 really formed to serve the need of growers for crop production insights and how to push the envelope and push in yield and quality. We've got three laboratories encompassing over 30,000 square feet of office space here in London. And this number is a little bit dated. We've been growing rapidly. We're now close to 150 dis multidisciplinary staff servicing clients, primarily in North America here in Canada and the US, but we do have a number of international clients. We are uh, uh, international clients. We offer a wide, wide range of services and technology, analytical testing services, precision ag, agronomic research. We've got a whole biological development that's really quite fascinating that we're not really talking about today. And then uh, a bunch of other products and services focused on agriculture. So our core business is really focusing on the analytical so uh, services associated to agriculture, primarily soil, plant, feed, fertilizer, and water analysis. But a lot of us are known much more for than our analytic services, but also our, our production recommendations. We do a lot of work in remote sensing and mapping and precision ag, um, different space that I'll talk a little bit about today. We've got another a division that's solely focused on uh, development research and now commercialization of biologicals, which is also where our soil health researchers come. Some of you have, might have heard of our, our Vital Soil Health Test. That's in our biological uh, division, which has got a very exciting future. Uh, our environmental group is really focused on more of the traditional organic and inorganic chemistry and general chemistry using all kinds of state-of-the-art technology and methodology. Our food and farmer division is really focused on the new cannabis and hemp market. We're the leading lab in, in Canada for, for helping cannabis production, not just with the, the testing of their matrix and plant and flower, but also method development for end use products. And then a lot of production recommendations for how to, to bring that crop uh, through to finish. A lot uh, more focus recently as well in our disease diagnosis and genetic analysis as well again as uh, some production recommendations tied into that space. And with the disease and genetic analysis, we're off for uh, a plant monitoring program as well, where we can set up uh, you know, some tissue sampling programs through the year to watch for disease and deficiencies before they're fully visual. So what makes us a little bit unique uh, than some of the other analytical labs out there? We're really founded by farmers to solve production issues. Uh, picture in the top right there, our founder, Greg Patterson, this guy with sunglasses. Uh, he started a &L about 30 years ago with a bunch of potato farmers in Alston to really look at how can we, you know, get some recommendation practices and recommendations out of the analytics lab and turn it into kind of a working lab where everything we did uh, in the lab here was validated by in-field research working with local agronomists and customers. So very much a in-field research type of business. And again, we see much more of our value in not just providing the analytics, but being able to help train um, and bring knowledge to people on what that analytics means through training seminars, educational uh, materials, and a really deep knowledge of agronomy to support our agronomy clients and farm clients in the marketplace. So traditionally, again, a lot of you had seen a, a typical soil test. It's a paper uh, copy with a, you know, a bunch of analytical PPM numbers. Uh, we still offer that service. That's a very important part of our business, but more and more of our future in our business is turning to more of the research-based value add services. In the top left here, you can see an example of our new Vital Soil Health uh, test, uh, which is trying to quantify the chemical, physical, and biological um, and really give you a quantified measure to help uh, rate your fields for soil health. 
We offer a number of tech bulletins, videos online, uh, smart submit soil apps, and all kinds of other reference materials that we encourage people to utilize uh, because we really see ourselves as an agent of knowledge transfer in, in this space. Some of the new services we're working on, I mentioned our Vital Soil Health Test. Um, that one's gaining a lot of traction over the market. Actually, just this year as well, we've launched the Vital Health Soil Health Bio Test, which actually quantifies uh, some of the different microbes that are within the soil uh, rhizome, in addition to just providing the, uh, the, the metrics that you're used to on this, uh, the Vital Soil Health Test. If, uh, if you've not heard, we've had a bit of a, a partnership, if you like, with, with Devron uh, Services, uh, Devron UAS Services to help us with plant and soil sampling services. A lot of agronomists or farmers in the fall or spring season get very busy and find that they need uh, help with sampling. So we partnered with Devron to offer that service. Devron is also a leader in the, the UAV and image acquisition from drone space. So if there's a, a need for retailers to acquire uh, or, or farmers to acquire aerial imagery without wanting to go through incurring all the costs to get in that space themselves, we would uh, bring in Devron to help acquire those, those UAV type imagery services. What I'm going to be talking to you today is about our TerraSite platform and how we're now making a tool to visualize some of these new tools. We've got, a, I mentioned a very expanded plant disease diagnostic service. We're now the largest uh, plant disease diagnostics agricultural lab in Canada, as well as that cannabis and hemp production service space. So a vast diverse business and uh, keeps us very busy and growing and we're very excited about uh, the new opportunities in this space. So focusing on today's topics, which is really uh, precision agriculture and where we fit into precision agriculture, um, just a little bit of history on how we got to where we are today. Um, a and has been playing in this space, if you like, uh, for quite some time back in the 80s and 90s, well before the, the word precision agriculture even existed. Our founder, Greg Patterson, who's a soil scientist by heart, uh, he loves the technology and always has been utilizing tools to look at how can we overlay different data layers to try and not just see what the soil analytics says, but hey, if we can use infrared uh, pictures or yield data to overlay those different layers of information and then look at its impact on yield or quality, there's probably some magic there. So back in the 80s, Greg was hanging out of a plane with literally IR film taking pictures of fields that we had sampled um, to see if we could see a difference in the reflectance from crops um, and the soil data. And we started making some, some interesting finds back then. Um, towards about 2000, 2010, Greg started getting into the multi-spec uh, camera business because a lot of the, the cameras were very expensive or military based or too heavy to use for agriculture and working with drones and satellites and other aerial providers to really look at these different image layers, including things like NDVI or biomass, um, and then overlaying them with some of our data to show, again, impacts on quality, yield, disease. Um, so lots of different kind of exciting things that we're finding there. But I think in some of the other platforms that you've heard from today, it was how do we get that information out there to share? So we put a strong focus um, over the last kind of 10 years, if you like, on being able to API our data into the vast majority of platforms that are out on the market today, large precision ag platforms. We've got API uh, agreements in place with those companies so that our soil data, our new precision data can bridge right in without the need for some of these uh, people who have already committed to those platforms to invest in a new platform. However, we do have a number of customers who do kind of, um, who haven't committed to one of the other larger platforms and they'd like to see the data on our own portal. Uh, so we've been uh, just recently launching a TerraSite platform that I'm gonna show you a bit more about today. Um, we're still working on commercializing our multi-spec camera, but we see that as more uh, a business, a tool to get another data later. It's not a big focus that we wanna get into selling cameras. Uh, we're looking at the technology and trying to find licensing partners. We really want to focus on the algorithms and the data interpretation um, and turning that, that data into knowledge rather than just analytics. So focusing on the TerraSite itself, um, the TerraSite, if any of you have worked with us at a and in the past, all of our data is available through what we call our data web client portal. And if your historical soil sample 
uh, re records and all our PDFs are still available on that data web client portal. Um, so anything you've done, plant tissue, soil health is, is, uh, is able to be accessed through there. We are developing, um, streamlining that portal so it's all kind of as one. But you also access currently the TerraSite platform through the data web. If you're unfamiliar with their data web or want to check it out a bit more, I definitely suggest you contact one of our reps directly or the agronomist you work with about uh, how you can get access to that through a &L. But if uh, you were in our data uh, web, the top portion right here is uh, you'd see this in all your data web um, uh, tools that you're looking at. And if you've done any site-specific sampling, and we'll talk about the importance of site-specific sampling in a slide or two today, um, you'll have another tab on your data web that says TerraSite RX, and that's where you're going to start to be able to visualize graphically some of these new spatial tools that we're looking at. So this is a demo account. There's only two fields in this demo account. Uh, but on the left hand side, we've got, uh, this is a general fertility index soil map that we offer with our soil sampling, and we're putting it side by side against a field health or yield map on soybeans. So we can start to look at good areas of the field versus yield and make some comparisons. And I'll go through that in a bit more detail in the slides to come. So the Terrace site itself is kind of two buckets of tools. One that I feel has a very novel um, edge, if you like, and, and that's kind of our soil data layer tools. And really there we're using, we're looking at how optimum levels of nutrients uh, within the field and then basing correlating that with biomass, which we can acquire either through yield information or imagery information from things like NDVI to really show some of those nutrient interactions. Right now, a lot of our algorithms have been tying those nutrient interactions to, to variable rate nutrient recommendation or yield opportunity, but uh, down the road and what we're working on now is a lot more also how that correlates to disease and, and uh, soil health as well as just yield quality and VR nutrients. So I'm going to show you uh, more in detail about our soil data analytics layers. The second bucket of tools is kind of some of the other, I would say more traditional algorithms that uh, some other players in the market are, are offering today. Uh, and we're developing in both spaces here. Currently our commercial offer, we can offer a crop damage tool for doing some wind or hail damage assessments, uh, a modified NDVI, which again, I'll show you some examples of in upcoming slides, plant count, uh, zone sampling and crop, st uh, crop stress map. So, so those are what's available today. Focusing on the soil specific tools. Now this is, uh, I'll show you some bigger blowing up maps here in a second. Uh, when you do a complete soil analysis with a &L and we site specific the data, so we're geo-referencing where the soil points come from. Um, our first base layer of maps that we produce is, is something that looks uh, what you're looking at here. And there's almost 30 different maps. And these are your actual analytical levels of soil nutrients spatially mapped across your field. So obviously we can only do this if we have the georeference information uh, for the soil samples. So these really, there's a couple here that are equations like our K to mag ratio, but for the most part, this is hard analytical data. It's actually not an algorithm at this point. Um, it's really the analytical data that we're measuring out of the lab to build these spatial nutrient variability maps that are the baseline uh, for, for, for the other analysis. So I keep talking about site-specific sampling. And I feel this is a very, very important piece for all growers moving forward. I don't care what lab you're working with, um, but we, in my opinion, we really start to need to geo-reference where we're taking our sample locations come from. And one of the reasons I strongly believe that is if we're gonna track our nutrient changes over a time, or try and look at uh, a ROI on changing a nutrient use uh, pattern or application method, we really need to be able to go back to the same exact spot from we sampled from in the past and, and collect samples from there over time to monitor those changes. We've seen huge differences in soil variability just feet away from points. So 
Um, I would say the more accurate you can get on georeferencing your samples, the better. Even if you're taking bulk or composite, I still recommend telling people if you can georeference where each one came from, um, just to keep that consistency and standard, uh, th that's very important moving forward. There's a lot of other new sensor technologies out there. We find uh, even a two and a half acre grid is still a very cost effective way uh, to identify your availability across the field. And uh, from a cost perspective, even at a two and a half acre grid, we're often very price competitive with a lot of that sensor based technology that still often needs to be calibrated. So we, we strongly recommend the site specific as a foundation uh, for your farms. And it's really the, the, the way to best optimize our nutrient use and cost to try and get better cost efficiency for things like VR application on the farm. So I, I showed you some of those maps. Again, this is a, the, just a bigger kind of view of uh, what potassium maps would look like if we site specific to farm. Uh, for those of you that work with, work with a and uh, you'll know that we don't just per, uh, present PPM numbers. We're actually showing uh, percents or indexed uh, values for the nutrients as well that accommodates for things like base saturation or soil type or how much CEC or clay, percent clay, silk, uh, sand, uh, and nutrient availability based on that. So we'll actually show you these different map layers for each one of the parameters that we report. Uh, on our charts, and they're the foundation layer uh, for the next soil analysis. So what we then do is we then, and this is kind of a slide, an interpretation slide, so I'm gonna explain what these slides are. We then take that yield information or that NDVI value, and in this case, you can see it says average yield value. So this is from a yield map, and we overlay it with those site-specific maps that I just show you and we produce one of these maps. And what you see is the bars, uh, this, this uh, one that we've measured here is organic matter. So the bars represent the percentage of your field within each one of these zones uh, for organic matter. So we've got about 15% of our field in this case in the zero to 2% organic matter. And we've got about, call it 12% in more of our optimum four to five and about 5% five to six uh, in our five to six percent organic matter. So the bars are also color coded for optimum zones based on our recommendations at, here at the lab. So these greens will recommend uh, will correlate to our optimum recommendations on our soil parts. So the bars are the percent fields within those layers. The line graph is then the yield data that's coming from within those fields. So if I go back to zero to uh, zero to two percent organic matter, I've got yield. This was a soybean field in this field from about call it 32 bushel to about 65 bushel, and my average yield was just under 55 bushel. If I look at my top yields in this field, I can see they came to my four to 5% organic matters, where I got the actual highest yield levels in this field at just over 70 bushel soybeans. And the same hold true for my average yield. My average yield is the highest level in my four to 5% organic matter. So we do this for each, here's another one for phos, uh, sorry, potassium. And this one, uh, we didn't have the yield information available, but we did have an NDVI image, which is really a biomass um, index of the field. So we're able to use NDVI to do the same um, analysis. And in this field, we see all of the, the, the producers potassium levels are below our green, or we would see the green bars, but we're seeing a direct linear correlation to potassium in this field where in our lower levels, um, you can see less total yield than in the next 120 to 160, if it was just potassium PPM. And same thing with our average yield um, is, is, is lower in the potassium um, at 80 to 120 than it is to 160. And again, we'll show the index value of potassium or the percentage available as well, depending on what you're used to using um, as a producer. So we do that for, uh, here's another one for phosphorus. This was based on yield. And again, you can see the phos levels here varying across the field. Um, the yield is actually relatively steady um, in all of the zones from the SD top end, um, but our highest yield was still in the 65 to 85 PPM of phosphorus determined by Bray. 
but our actual average highest yield on average was in that 85 to 110 ppm range. And when we look at the index um, or saturation, you can see that we've seen some uh, decent yields again at these higher levels of phosphorus. So we're going through um, all our, our, our majors, our secondaries, but even our micros as well. We're making up these charts to show you how much field is within those zones and where you're getting your big yields by nutrient um, from all of those elements. So it really helps the agronomist go through um, and say, in, in the case of manganese here, again, I can see almost a direct correlation of yield going from in my zero to five PPM areas to my 30 to 60 PPM areas. So now if I've got 30 of these different maps to go through, it's kind of hard to say, well, which one's more important to, than the next? So the next piece that we offer in this slide is kind of a summary where we've taken all those and put them together. And what this graph here is showing us is it's saying, hey, these factors on the right-hand side, in this case, magnesium and potassium and my, my calcium, um, I've got more of my field in decent zones, areas of these nutrients than I do the nutrients on the left side of the chart. So if I look at my FOSS and my zinc and my bicarb, um, I've got very little chunks of my field, about two and a half percent that are in, that are in good areas. Whereas in the potassium and mag, I've got you know, closer to 25% of my field that's in good areas. So this chart is not saying you will not get a response from potassium or additional potassium in this field. It's saying that you might be better off focusing on zinc um, uh, before spending more money on potassium because you've got a lot more areas of your field that are hugely deficient. It's then the baseline for our variability recommendation maps. This one happens to be Lyme, if we're recommending Lyme just as an actual, or if we're doing it based on the calcium saturation, we can split out the different variabilities. Um, so really without understanding the priority of the nutrients we should be fo uh, focusing on and which ones first, it makes it hard to make great VR maps in our opinion. So that, that's the basis of you like of the soil um, apps. Some of the other apps that we're um, uh, looking at are modified NDVI. A lot of you are familiar with NDVI maps. Um, the left here is like a standard NDVI map. Um, the right hand is our modified NDVI map where you can see much more contrast in the areas of stress in the field. So it just makes it a much more visual uh, way to identify problem areas or areas that we should be scouting rather than just the standard NDVI. Um, here's an example of a, a stress map or a damage map that was used for, for hail and canola, um, showing severe damage in the dark red um, up to the blue areas where there was much less damage. We see some of these uh, maps for this one is hail, this one is for wind, uh, wind and corn. We see these important to probably a bit more with producers and their insurance companies. You know, when you have a damaging event go through the field, uh, typically the producer would think it's, you know, call it 30 to 50% damage and the adjuster would come in and say it's 10 to 20% uh, damage. So there's always that way of how do we really quantify it? Um, we think a lot of these new precision ag tools are going to be a great way and means to, to, to put some quantifiable numbers to actual damage within a field. Stress maps, same thing. Uh, a lot of these tools, they've got a lot of value in higher value crops. Um, so we're using stress maps predictively to identify areas of the field that we see watchouts or concerns for. And then we'll often uh, initiate a tissue sampling program called our plant monitoring program, where we start and again, geo-reference those points and go back to those specific points throughout the year. Uh, so we can see uh, often disease or deficiency before it actually st uh, starts in, in the field and then take corrective action before it's a big deal. Some zoning and site-specific sampling tools. These, again, are there's a few other companies offering uh, similar types of things, uh, depending on your sampling strategy. Plant counts and plant density. Um, we see these ones a bit more for higher value crops. Right now, most of the plant count uh, tools on the market 
are, are better suited to, to, to row crops where there's a distinguished row. And almost all of them also need uh, to be used early in the season before the canopy closes because the algorithms struggle once the canopy closes. But things like pumpkins or squash or even sweet corn, where it's harder to, uh, you do want to handle on, you do want to have a better handle on how many squash or pumpkins do I have in the field. We see some of the plant count opportunities for some of those crops to be uh, an opportunity as well. Development, uh, precision ag space is a constant uh, development space. I won't read through all of these, but what you'll see at the top is, you know, more of the traditional type of tools, yield prediction, compaction, weed pressure. And as we go to the bottom, more and more is about disease and, and quality tools. That, and, and, and then again, also I didn't really talk much, but the biological impact on all this as well. So we see it pretty exciting. We're really close to launching this one. This one's actually a yield and phenology uh, tracking tool for wheat and corn and soybeans. We've got the highest accuracy right now on wheat and corn. This is a county level map. So if you're a large farmer or an agronomist and you're wanting to track the actual staging of your wheat across the county, um, you know, and I'd say, hey, why is this field so much different than this field? Maybe I better go check stuff out. So you can blow that up at the field level or at a county level. We think that one's kind of exciting. Again, we've got about a month out to get a 92% correlation to a predictive yield. Another one on compaction, and we're going to be looking at tools to say, hey, here's where you're prone to more compaction based on uh, water holding capacity, field capacity, as well as your CEC, how much sand or clay uh, that you have in the map. So this one's close to being launched. Uh, the weed pressure, I talked about this. Nobody's talked much about variable rate herbicides yet. Uh, we see that coming very quickly with both ground applied and the new drone technology. So a key in variable rate herbicide is going to be identifying where the weeds are and then the species identification, which we're working on as well. I just mentioned species identification. Here's one we're doing in turf uh, to detect POA versus blue, uh, bent grass or look at damage from things like ants or other pests. Uh, hydrological properties to show drainage based off LIDAR data or RTK data from the combine. The actual RTK data from the combine is often pretty reliable and uh, I don't want to say as good as the LIDAR, but it's amazing what we can use just with our TK combine information if we don't have the LIDAR coverage. Once we've got things like the LIDAR drainage and slope, which has got some NASM opportunity, we can also start to look at field capacitor and water availability and uh, any of our friends in the western states that do a lot of dry land farming, you know, it's really important for them to know if they've got enough water to finish a crop. So we see tools like this to be very important to say, yes, you do go apply your additional nitrogen or no, you don't pull back on that last application because it's gonna burn up in the field because the moisture is not there. Planted area of a field, that's another one too, that could uh, planted area what didn't take or it could be a winter kill uh, from wheat over uh, seasoning, probably another insurance tool or a replant tool. There's some other fungicide application, VR application tools out there. We're building one where you can put in the price of your crop and the price of your fungicide plus application and make a sliding bar where you can see your ROI is. Um, if you do want to do a two rate on off or a high, row lay, uh, high low uh, medium rates, you could start to play with those types of variables as well. And then some of the other stuff for some of our specialty markets crop height uh, estimation, canopy estimation for things like cannabis and orchard. These are very high value, high regulated crops. Uh, they wanna know where the weed pressure is. They wanna know what the staging's at. Um, in some cases, they really have limited options for putting any inputs once the crop is down. Um, so for them measuring what they did before and then quantifying it with digital tools because of the, the security concerns and people going into the field, um, lots of opportunity there. So I'm almost at my time. Um, and if any of you have more questions, we do have dedicated A&L reps across Canada. And we're offering a few in the US as well. Uh, we work very closely with the ag retailers, the ag consultants uh, in the marketplace. You can visit us online at alcanada.com uh, where we've got all kinds of resources, including my contact information. And uh, I welcome questions, comments, or any other feedback that you might have. So thank you very much. Thank you, Brendan. Uh, thank you for your time at this presentation today. Uh, we have a couple of questions coming in and I'll start with the first. Uh, do you happen to know when the NDVI values were collected? 
So NDVI values, um, uh, I'm not 100% sure on the background of the question. I would say the, the, the value of the timing on when it collected depends on, the, uh, on what you're using it for. Um, if you're watching uh, crop progression through the season, um, you know, we can have more time in between images um, as long as we've got an image relatively close to our predictive state. If we're wanting to use NDVI for a nitrogen application, then we have to make sure we pretty much get in the field relatively close to that nitrogen application date, so within days. Uh, we can actually make NDVI images from satellite image, uh, but often the resolution might not be high enough to get what we need. So satellite, depending on the frequency, some are up to five days a week now. Um, drone, we can typically get a drone in the day before a nitrogen application to generate the NDVI. For our wheat predictive tool, we actually use early season imagery um, and then satellite towards the tail end to, 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 to make sure there's been no catastrophic change um, and, and then bring those all together to make our predictive tool. So I, I gave a bit of a ambiguous answer there, but I would say it really depends on what you need it for. Okay, the next one we have is how are you georeferencing your soil samples? So, you know, I've got, uh, and, and the, the, the purists out there will say never use your phone because there's too much air in your phone. Um, some of the major precision ag companies now have smart uh, soil apps where, you know, your phone is your geo reference guide and it takes you in and when it turns green, you pull the core. Obviously, a lot of the, the retailers, agronomists have more expensive, more accurate systems, and I would always uh, promote the highest level of accuracy possible when georeferencing, but a phone is better than nothing. Um, so if you've got, you know, a handheld um, unit that gives you that higher level of accuracy, that's great. If the phone is all you've got, that's better than, than, than a hope and a prayer or a guess. Uh, the other tool is more and more people are offering tools to be able to lay out the sample points on the map online. Um, and then your phone just takes you to that point. So again, you could have air depending on if you're using a phone, how many satellites you have with three feet ish, um, which, and again, I told you, you can have variability within three feet. Um, but what a lot of us are used to was just, uh, yeah, it was about over there without any geo reference. That's a huge improvement from what we've been doing in the past. Thank you, Brandon. The next one up is for irrigation management, is soil texture available for water features of the soil, such as field capacity, wilting point and saturation? So, uh, you know, I, I bring in some other experts here. One of our things we found um, or organic matter is one of the, the, the biggest attributes of organic matter is its, its water holding capacity. Um, obviously, organic matter ties into your CEC, but then your percent sand, silt, clay. Um, even I think we do need to, your field holding capacity versus water availability is going to start to factor in for your CEC and your organic matter. But you're also going to want to watch your evapotranspiration, your wind, uh, bringing in that weather data. Um, to me, the biggest opportunities with this stuff with the irrigation is not whether um, I need to irrigate or not. It's uh, how do I not turn the irrigators on till I really need them? So at the end of the season, if I can get away, uh, if I can cut back one or two applications of water, that's a big savings. But you know, with field holding capacity, if you're looking from an irrigation management, I would definitely consider bringing in your weather stations to looking for wind and humidity and temperature. Um, and there's also some new leaf, this, uh, leaf wetness sensors that we can really uh, validate what the, the crop moisture is actually saying as well. So those tools, that accuracy is gonna get better and better as we incorporate more and more sensors and different data layers to give us the um, on off tools for irrigation, if you like. Well, I don't have any more questions coming up, uh, but uh, we do have a compliment, a uh, great presentation. Thank you from our audience. Uh, Thank you to all the audience. I wish I could do it in front of you in person, maybe next year. Yes, so uh, yeah, no more questions, but uh, thank you uh, to all our audience for being a part of the session, for attending the session. Thank you, Brandon, uh, for putting this together and uh, you know presenting uh, your talk here. Uh, 
If anyone has questions for Brandon, uh, please feel free to connect with him on the networking tab and the one to one. Uh, and Brandon will definitely be responding to all of the questions that uh, he will have on this uh, special session. Yes. Again, yeah, thank you. Bye now. Thanks, guys.